Hello, I'm Diana Reich, the Artistic Director of the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival, Join the Conversation, and I'd like to welcome you from wherever you may be watching. Transforming the way that the festival is delivered, from live appearances to an online version, and offering an even stronger, more diverse and plentiful series of events is a reflection of our belief that literature and the arts provide a catalyst for dialogue, creativity, empathy, laughter and tears, binding communities together. We're enormously grateful to all our speakers who've dedicated their time and talents to the festival. Please buy their books as a way of enhancing the festival experience. It's my pleasure to invite you, on behalf of my colleagues and board, as well as myself, to join the conversation. We hope that you'll do so in person next November, if at all possible. Charleston in South Carolina is a beautiful, historic and hospitable town, and the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival will definitely be going from strength to strength. I'm Suzanne Pollack, Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. This year, more than ever, we are so grateful to our generous donors, returning and new, who've made it possible to offer free sessions to everyone everywhere, building a truly international audience. There's still time for you to become a donor. We're taking donations throughout the month of November. So if you would like to become a sponsor, and we urge you to do so, please contact me using my email on the website. Thank you. Hi, I'm Suzanne Pollack, the Director of Development for the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival. I'm sitting in the fourth floor library at a beautiful inn, 20 South Battery in downtown Charleston. We're all living through a pandemic right now, so it's no surprise that some of the events feature historical plagues. Emma Donahue is an Irish author and dramatist living in Canada. She is well known for her historical and contemporary fiction. Emma adapted her best-selling, award-winning novel, Room, into a film, based on her own loving experience of parenthood and the Fritzl family escape from a dungeon in Austria. Her current novel, The Pull of the Stars, was inspired by the Great Flu of 1918. Although historical, the story has significant contemporary relevance. Bill Goldstein is an editor of the New York Times Books website book critic for the weekend edition of WNBC's Today in New York, and author of the nonfiction cultural history, The World Broken Two. Welcome to the session with Emma Donahue and Bill Goldstein. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Goldstein. I'm here uh, virtually in Charleston with Emma Donahue, the author of most recently of the Pull of the Stars, a wonderful novel. I, I love her work and I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk with her uh, today. I wish that we could all be in Charleston in person, uh, but I am very grateful to all of my many friends at the Charleston to Charleston Literary Festival for arranging this virtual session and for inviting me once again to participate in Charleston to Charleston, and I just want to say hello to the many people in Charleston I wish I were seeing in person this weekend. Uh, but here I am in New York with my bookshelves behind me, and Emma Donahue is in London, Ontario, and so here we go, uh, pretending that we are actually in Charleston on the stage of one of your beautiful venues. So good morning, Emma. Good morning. Nice to, nice to talk to you again. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the pull of the stars and then we'll talk about more of your work. Oh, I'm sorry. I just did want to make one logistical uh, uh, point um, as we begin. So usually when we are doing these things live and in person, we would talk for a while and then we would have a Q&A, an audience Q&A. But one of the good things about doing it virtually is that you in the audience can post your questions or your comments as 
our conversation is unfolding. So we will have a virtual Q&A at the end, but if you have comments as we're going along, that would uh, on two, two uh, uh, scores uh, be helpful. One, I might be able to incorporate uh, your questions or your comments into uh, our conversation, ask Emma to follow up on something if that's what you're interested in. Or once the Q&A gets underway, we'll have the questions queued up and we will have a smooth transition from our conversation to the conversation among all of us. So that's the logistical point I should have made at the beginning. But Emma, so let's talk a bit about the pull of the stars and then talk about uh, other books of yours because uh, so many of them are books that I've loved and read and reread uh, a number of times. So The Pull of the Stars, it's, it's uncanny that you were writing this book uh, given uh, world history uh, in the last nine months. So why don't you just tell people a little bit about what The Pull of the Stars is about and how it came that your timing was so, uh, uh, I don't wanna use the word miraculous because that makes it seem as if uh, something good has been happening, but uh, uncanny, I guess, is a, is a good word. Yeah, tell me about it. It's been very bizarre timing for me because um, I was prompted to write The Pull of the Stars, which is about the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, I was prompted by reading an article about that flu pandemic in October 2018, so 100 years on. It was all about the centenary of the flu. It was very much in the distant past. But, you know, I always find that historical fiction when you bring to it, you know, the concerns of a modern author, it's always going to be kind of a meeting between two historical moments. It's never just about the past. Even if you scrupulously keep out anachronism, there's always a kind of a, you know, a spark jumping between generations. So yes, I wrote the novel and sold it and, and delivered the very, very final draft um, on the 3rd of March this year for publication next year, because they said, oh, let's avoid the US election. You know, not a good time to be publishing fiction. So then COVID happened. And at first I honestly didn't see any connection because you know COVID was so new and so bizarre. And, but then my publishers called up and said, it's a pandemic novel, so let's bring it out this July. I honestly didn't know that big publishers could move that fast and do a phenomenal <laughs> job of you know, the design and the usual you know, two rounds of copy editing. It's a very rigorous process. I was so lucky, Bill, that um, my copy editor, the same one I had for my novel, The Wonder, which again was about medical stuff, um, she is an emergency room doctor as well as a copy editor. She, so she was, you know, half time looking after COVID patients, half time catching my terrible errors. So I felt so relieved to have her. And also I hired a midwife to check it as well, because you do not want to mess around with, you know, truthiness when you're writing about um, illness and childbirth. And in particular, when you're writing about the realities of a pandemic and you're publishing that during a pandemic. So completely, completely, um, unexpected and coincidental timing, basically, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about the, the story. I mean, it's, it's centered, it's in Dublin, uh, Ireland. It takes place over three days. There are three main characters. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how pregnancy and childbirth and uh, why you were so uh, grateful to have a midwife or why you brought in, you know, call the midwife, uh, why you called the midwife in to help you uh, with the copy editing and the correcting. Sure. I mean, you know, readers of read any of my work will know that I kind of like enclosed spaces anyway, you know, much like the <laughs> classic locked room murder mystery. I simply find it easier to build up intensity between characters if I somehow limit their options to move. Um, but in this case, in particular, because I was writing about a pandemic happening in the middle of a world war, it could so easily have got scattered and diffused if I tried to somehow capture all, all the realities of that global conflict and global health crisis. So I really knew I needed to focus. And early on in my research, I came across the little known fact that the people most likely to catch this terrible new flu were women in late pregnancy and just after birth, something to do with their immune system response. So I thought, where did they put these women? Because I haven't found any factual evidence about um, how they managed, you know, you couldn't really have women giving birth in an ordinary flu ward, but nor could you have infectious, contagious women in a regular birth ward. So I thought they had to put them in some kind of quarantine ward. That might be small enough that it would be run by one nurse. And so I had my heroine, Julia Power. And then when I was working, I had very detailed files on her tasks, like how she would 
you know, make a beef tea, how would she would um, change a bed? And I soon realized she can't do these things single handed. She absolutely needs another pair of hands. So I invented the character of Bridie Sweeney, a completely untrained volunteer who walks in off the street as, as literally another pair of hands for Julia. And as a good contrast, because Julia is extremely well trained and and experienced, um, even though she's not that senior, she's only 29. And then I thought, you know, nurses were constantly having to defer to doctors and ask doctors, you know, doctor has had to prescribe even an aspirin, a nurse couldn't hand out without a doctor. Um, the, the medical hierarchy was very sort of Victorian then. And then I thought, okay, out of all the doctors in that hospital, it would be interesting to choose one who's a woman for this maternity ward. So then I was trying to come up with a fictional um, uh, doctor who would have an expertise in midwifery. And I came across the very real historical character of Kathleen Lynn, this extraordinary Irish doctor who no hospital would um, hire full time, partly because she was a woman and the male doctors didn't want a female colleague, and partly because she was a revolutionary. She was involved in Sinn Féin the 1916 Rising, and she was on, get this, she was on the run from police during the month in which my novel was set, while she was also rub, running a flu clinic for the poor. So, you know, I could not keep her out of my book. So in the first draft, I tried to give Kathleen Nina just a fictional name. Um, and in the second draft, I had to let her step forward. So yes, we end up with these three very different women from three points on the kind of spectrum of, of hospital politics. Well, I, she, as a historical figure, I mean, as a historical person, she's as unusual a combination as your doctor copy editor. I mean, I've never you know, heard of, of that um, in, in, I mean, I guess I haven't really thought of uh, them as twin careers, but uh, that's that seems to be something you uncover in life as well as in history. Well, you know, the copy editor, I suppose, has just the highest possible standards of accuracy and truth and sort of almost a hygiene of words as well as of germs. So you could say that that's what her two jobs have in common. And with Dr. Kathleen Lynn, she had a, a massively um, powerful commitment to the poor and to women. I mean, she became an Irish revolutionary revolutionary first by being concerned for Belgian refugees and for the suffrage cause for women and for the poor and then out of that she started to realize that really Ireland had to run its own affairs so hers was a nationalism that was not based on kind of smugness about oh we Irish are different it was more like this wretched country is in such a mess the slums of Dublin were, were said to be the worst um west of of uh, Bombay as they called Mumbai then um, so she had a, a passion for social justice, which is exactly what led her to be a doctor and a revolutionary, even though it might seem paradoxical to have, you know, the gun in one hand and the, the scalpel in the other. I mean, which is another way in which the novel, uh, not only uh, in terms of the pandemic, but in the social justice movement that uh, has you know, come to a renewed force. I mean, it's not new, obviously, in the United States um, or in Canada, uh, you know, people that 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 is another thing that makes the novel uncanny. And I'm curious how, as you're writing, I mean, you've described how these characters come into the book. You're, you're, how are you balancing your writing and your research as you're moving forward? Because you have these characters and then you do more research. I mean, so if you could just talk about how in your mind the novel begins to come together are you oh. writing and then you step aside to do more research or is it yes, it, more it does go in waves but i start i start with a great deal of research because i've always found that doing research for a novel it's not like when i did research for my phd you don't have to keep notes and everything it's more that you're almost following a sense you're trying to sniff out good stories and the, the facts you find they don't have to be representative of how it was for everybody in those days they just have to be possible or plausible so it's a very fun kind of free associating kind of research so um yeah one one decision I had to make early on once I decided it was to be a maternity ward and I thought well I'll it could be anywhere in the world, but I'll go for Dublin because it's my hometown and because Irish politics was in such a state of upheaval. You know, really in, in about 1918, most people would have said we are loyal subjects of the king. And 10 years later, they were all saying we have our own country. So, um, yeah, it was a very exciting time. But in particular, I had to decide where this hospital would be that Julia worked for. And I decided that it should be an inner city hospital because then she would have patients from the slums. I just thought that was more interesting, frankly, because in, then in a way, the novel's political questions arise really naturally out of the bodies of her patients. 
um, her patients are coming in already weakened by what we now call pre-existing conditions. You know, um, in, in, in Ireland, it was not that they were, say, racialized. It was that they were working class. So they had bad water, bad air, damp housing. I've seen photographs. Photographs were a key source for me. And you see the plaster peeling off the walls in a fungal way. Um, and then, you, see, you know, you see government advice saying things like seek out fresh air and sunshine. And I'm thinking, how if you lived in one of these rotting 18th century buildings with, you know, a family in every single room. Um, so, so, yeah, deciding to make it an inner city hospital was key. And in particular, that meant that the women were having sometimes 12 babies. You know, and Ireland had this kind of relentlessly, um, what you call it, um, pronatalist culture. I'm just going to pause and let my cat out. I'm sorry, my cat is voting to leave. Okay. <laughs> of course, you will now start to be let back, back in because that is the nature of cats in any century. <laughs> well, you're in very good company. The other night, um, I was watching uh, Cher on Stephen Colbert, and you could see in the background her cat walking out of the frame. I mean, and, and I just, I thought, I wonder if this cat knows that it is Cher's cat, but, you know, presumably it, I'm not. sure the cat would think of Cher as the cat's human. Yes, I'm sure that's the way it I hope it was an elegant cat. You wouldn't it want was, Cher It was a beautiful seen. black cat. I mean, what I, I could see. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, anyway, well, you our were, cat is a redhead called Siobhan, so I feel she's she's appropriate. She's appropriate to me in some ways. I wanted to uh, call our daughter Siobhan, but my Canadian friends overruled me and said it was impossible to spell, so we saved the name. <laughs> the cat. Um, you're you're speaking about the details uh, that you discovered, I mean, why you placed it in the slums, et cetera, the, uh, the, the story and the politics really arising out of the bodies of your characters. I mean, one of the things that's very impressive about the book and about much else in, in, your, uh, uh, in your writing is that these details come through, but is it, is it work for you as you're writing to get those details in uh, seamlessly or almost paradoxically invisibly uh, as a, so so that you're not having your characters make didactic speeches i mean there's none of that there's no preaching here uh and and i'm curious about how you make the social justice themes come through visually through the language without making them spoken necessarily yeah no that's a very good point and as with all your research whether it's you know political or not you can't let it show so i would have had a huge sort of fact files on all these matters, even something like, okay, that the, the practicalities of being a nurse, you know, it would be very boring if I took my readers through the exact process of how you change the bed, bed while a patient was still in it, you know, so I chose just a couple of tasks, like I thought, okay, Julia needs to teach Bridie how to wash her hands really, really well, you know, because Bridie would have had no training in, in the theory of asepsis, you know, so that's the kind of key detail, and once I do that, then I can you know, just gloss over all the other things she'll teach her that day, because, you know, the key thing was teaching her about the killing of germs in just one respect. Um, and then um, I suppose in terms of the politics, I, I always tried to keep it um, to keep the commentary attached to very specific triggers, I suppose. So, you know, literally, as, as Dr. Kathleen Lynn and Julia are doing an autopsy of a patient um, you know, they're looking at the lungs of the patient, which, you know, she died of pneumonia after flu, so they're all filled up with liquid. So Dr. Lin brings in an anecdote about a friend of hers who, who died after force feeding, you know, because force feeding of whether Irish revolutionary prisoners or of suffragettes, it quite often intruded liquid into the lungs. So, you know, I thought, you know, she's not going to just suddenly start telling this story about her dead comrade at random, but while she's handling a pair of you know, appallingly traumatized lungs that might come up. So, so that to me is, is the crucial thing. It's finding, you know, the exact stitch where the, where the little bead will attach to the fabric as it were. Um, and, and yes, of course you do further waves of research. Um, even I remember one of my uh, editors saying something about um, a baby, um, a baby that's facing the wrong way in utero um, being born, uh, I think, um, forgetting the phrase now, something like Starwise or, or, you know, a stargazer, stargazer. And because I already had my title, The Pull of the Stars, I was like, okay, I have to have a stargazing baby in there. So I'll go back and, and change one of the births to make the baby be stargazing. So I, I sort of added layers to some of the births because I want them all to be different. But I didn't transform anything because I do a huge amount of planning beforehand about who's going to be 
in the book and and what stories I want them to tell. Um, I'm I'm all for I'm all for planning. I know it might seem to sort of kill the magic, but but not a bit. Um, magicians constantly practice, for instance. So you know when they achieve dazzling um, sleight of hand effects, it's because they've practiced rigorously. <laughs> Um, so I think similarly, the more preparation I put into my novels, the more I, able I am to achieve moments where they seem to kind of take flight. Well, I like the, the, uh, the picture of the beads, uh, attaching the beads, because uh, uh, a beautiful line in the author's note, I mean, at the, at the end of The Pull of the Stars, it's just that the pull of the stars is a fiction pinned together with facts. And um, so I, I like the, this continuous sort of sense of you sewing and stitching and, and working at the fabric of the novel. So, uh, it's a pure the, metaphor. My actual sewing skills are, are remedial, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you you sew well at the typewriter. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> you can't do everything. Um, one of the things that was, you, as you were talking, I was thinking about how uh, the one character is teaching the other, you know, how to wash our hands. I, I realized you didn't use the, the mnemonic device of singing happy birthday uh, twice, uh, which was drummed into all our heads, you know. In, no, in I, you know, during the copy editing, which I think was in April, I didn't add anything from COVID. All I did was, um, in the book, there were a few points where I hadn't used the word pandemic, even though it was technically correct because my sense was that back then they mostly talked about you know flu outbreak or or epidemic at most i thought pandemic sounded too sciencey but of course by april everyone was saying pandemic so i let myself put the word pandemic back in but that's the only thing i remember changing the rest did not need to be to be changed to to echo covid the, the, the parallels were extraordinary anyway um, well that brings me to another issue that i wanted to raise which goes back to something you said before about working hard so that there are no anachronisms. Um, and that's true, I think, of the language of your books too, as well as you know, this, the sense of what the characters know, what, what they are feeling in their own time. I mean, in this novel and in your other historical novels like Life Mask or Slammerkin or The Sealed Letter, I'm thinking of all of these books. And so can you talk a bit about your writing, the language and the perspective? Because you talked about the locked room perspective, which I want to get to uh, after that, but anachronism uh, in, in perfecting or the lack of anachronism in perfecting a historical novel seems to uh, elude other practitioners of this craft, but not, not you. So could you talk about that feeling well, and how you created it? Historical novelists were a very varied bunch. And the ones that I think of as say postmodern, they would say, look, the whole thing is, is a fake anyway, right? You can't truly really know what it was like to be in the year 1600. So you might as well be playful and stick in modern references and you know highlight the fictionality of the whole thing. Whereas some of us, maybe especially who have a bit more sort of academic or historical training, we think that in fact, you can do a pretty good job of guessing what it might've been like back then. And luckily nobody from 1600 is ever going to rear their head and tell you you were wrong. But you know, I think through the books of the time in particular and through pictures of the time, um, you probably can you know, get quite an accurate representation of how it was for them. And of course, a, a novel is a fiction anyway. So I don't see why a fiction set in 1918 is any fakier than one set now. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think um, linguistic precision um, is crucial. Now, if if, if, a, if a word is only dated as having been used from 1922, I would let myself use it for 1918, especially as the dictionaries didn't always carry, they didn't always capture usages as soon as the usages um, came into force. You know, people weren't um, you know rushing to announce a word the way they might now on the internet. So I'm sure people were sometimes informally using word long before the dictionaries caught it. But, but yes, I do try and be quite um, precise about the words they used back then, because of course, what you're really looking to do is avoid psychological anachronism. You don't want your 1918 character being so touchy feeling feely about their patients. Um, you know, nurses were trained in a very rigorous way. So for instance, Julia has been trained to never tell your patients your first name completely inappropriate. So when in fact she does, it's a sign that she's really letting, letting the rules break down as, as the hospital um, is under such pressure from understaffing and, and too many patients. You know, things are really falling apart if, if she's admitting to the patients that her name is Julia. So to get that kind of 
psychological accuracy, I think you have to sort of follow the words because the words of each era do really show you the tone of what people felt. So one thing I tried to capture among the medical staff in 1918 was a kind of a chipper, you know, keep your chin up, keep calm and carry on. And they, they often wrote to each other, sometimes actually from the war, from the battlefront, you know, with this very no nonsense, no emotion. And yes, they were capable of showing emotion, but they always tended to underplay it. Unlike, say, a contemporary teenager now, if I was trying to capture their vibe, they'd all be talking about having anxiety attacks in class when what they meant was, I feel slightly nervous about the math quiz. So, you know, each era has its, has its emotional flavor. And um, being scrupulous about the wording was my way of trying to capture that mindset of 1918. You know, the, we have been through hell for four years. We don't know how long it's going to last. Many people thought the war might have lasted until 1920, and they were just trudging on, you know. I mean, you, one of the things, the reason I asked about the anachronism is uh, in, again, the author's note to Life Mask, um, uh, you, which was published in 2004, uh, you, it's a, you talk about the fact that uh, what might seem like anachronistic, this is set in the, in the um, uh, 19th century, what might seem like anachronistic allusions to the Bill Clinton impeachment, such as the stained dress or whether a woman could have sex with a man without the man having sex with her are real uh, details from the Codrington trial. And I just, I just, I loved that here, once again, I mean, things that might seem anachronistic actually are true to the time and that you have to work to, to make that uh, um, happen. Uh, the, you know, the thing one, about thing I, one thing I fretted about with this novel was that my modern readers might judge my nurses and doctors harshly for what would look like mistakes. Um, there's a moment, for instance, when one character has a sudden heart attack and dies. And, you know, in my first draft, Julia just sort of checks her pulse and then goes, oh, we've lost another one, you know? And I could almost hear my contemporary readers saying, do the staying alive thing, you know? <laughs> because we're all so aware of CPR that I didn't think my readers would realize that in 1918, you, you pretty much just said, oh, well, we lost one. So I, I went back and did another layer of research working out, was there any sort of equivalent of CPR they did then? And I found one very ineffective technique where you would lie the, the dying person down on their front and you would sort of hold their arms up behind them in an effort to, to sort of push blood into their chest. So I have Julia do this just to, to show that she's trying all she can, because there were moments when I almost needed to give a footnote saying, you know, this looks negligent, this looks sloppy, this looks, for instance, psychologically cruel sometimes. And there's a, a stillbirth referred to, and the protocol is you just box up that stillbirth, put it on a high shelf and don't refer to it again. But this is how medicine was in 1918. And I needed to be true to that, even if there were moments when I knew my modern reader would be going, she what? Uh, you were talking before about the letters uh, that people would write and how they were more chipper. I mean, in, in the own, you know, my own sort of historical research uh, for, you know, an earlier book I wrote, I mean, you're, when you have the diaries of a person and their letters, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Virginia Woolf, the work I did on Virginia Woolf, you see how even in confessional letters or letters that are verging on talking about bad news, there is an effort to entertain, to you know, play down. Whereas, and and if we only had the letters, we might misread that moment in that person's life or their emotional you know, temperature at that at that time. And often it's the diaries that are telling us what they are really feeling and the version that they're offering and how letters are representative, but might not always speak from the heart. There were, there were performance, definitely, just as people's Facebook posts can sometimes, you know, perform this fabulous okay. life, which as we know may not be true. You know, one crucial source to me was um, memoirs or even, you know, brief memoir essays by nurses looking back on this 1918 pandemic. And you might expect that they would say that was a time of complete horror, but they're so nostalgic about it. They clearly felt so excited to be needed, you know, and the emphasis was on nursing, partly because doctors had so little to offer in the way of medicine. I mean, aspirin or sometimes hot whiskey was about as much as they had. And um, so key, you know, key to a patient's recovery was just really attentive nursing, trying to keep them, you know, well rested and hydrated enough that um, their own immune system could, could hopefully eventually save them. So nurses knew that they were really in the spotlight in a way they hadn't been before and especially with so many men away at the war and um i think i think for a lot of nurses it was their glory days um i even found in in a, in a 
a book by Nancy Bristow about the flu in America, there was this volunteer who volunteered at a hospital for six days, caught the flu and died of it. But apparently on her deathbed said, this has been the best week of my life. So I tried to write a novel in which that could plausibly be true, that you know, it's a, it's a grueling situation, but it's enormously exciting to feel, to feel necessary, to feel useful. You know, I mean, I've often felt a bit sheepish that all I do is write books and they, they touch people's lives. Yes, but it's not quite the same as actually being, you know, the doctor or the nurse or the social worker or the teacher who directly helps people. You know, I mean, it's what we read about or, you know, if we weren't veterans of you know, World War Two. I mean, you know, that camaraderie or in World War One, the camaraderie of the foxhole, the camaraderie of the battlefield. But what you're saying about about the nurse who, who died. Uh, so. Uh, I'm, I'm working uh, on a biography of Larry Kramer, I mean, the AIDS activist, the writer who died in May at, at the age of 84, almost 85. And one of the things that he talked about a lot was even amid the horror, I mean, of the 80s um, and, and the peak of death um, uh, in the AIDS epidemic and the fear uh, for him and others as gay men, I mean, you know, what was this unknown disease that he, he remembered now um, the, the camaraderie of it. I mean, both camaraderie with people who had died, but also the camaraderie with people who had survived and also felt the, a great loss that more people, no matter what they had achieved, that more people had not been saved, that people continue to die. So, so that camaraderie, I mean, what your uh, nurse, what the nurse you talked about who died or you know the, the woman who died after only a week um, of involvement, I mean, I think is, is in microcosm what many people feel in that commitment uh, to, to their fallen brethren, you know, to other, you know, to dying people. Um, so, uh, so that was very touching even when I read it and it's also touching to hear you say that. I, I wanted to talk um, about something you had raised earlier, which is structure in a book and perspective and the control of, of the language and perspective. You talked about the locked room uh, mystery, uh, how that is something you think of. Obviously, uh, I guess it's your most famous book, Room, uh, is written uh, very much, uh, not only from that perspective, but in that physical location. So if we could talk about Room and how you, uh, how, how I, that structurally suited your purposes, I mean, or your, your goals, but also uh, the construction of that book and the language once again, because as we're talking about anachronistic language uh, for the different periods you've written about, that was narrated from the perspective of Jack, the five-year-old boy. And so even, I'm, I'm not sure if the right word is anachronistic, but how did you perfect, which it is so perfect, the language and vision of a five-year-old boy in telling that story and in narrating it through history. You know, this is, it's a really, it's an area on which people do not agree. I've had letters from people saying to me, that child, um, he speaks in an extraordinarily sophisticated way. He couldn't possibly, you're, you're being inaccurate. And then the next day, somebody will write to me saying, how does Ma allow Jack to use all those sloppy basic errors? Surely she would have had time to fix them. <laughs> so people expect um, every five-year-old to speak like either the five-year-old they remember when their own children were five or the one they happen to know, like a grandchild. And I don't think they realize that there is a real range, right? So Jack is being sort of hyper homeschooled by an educated mother. You know, he's not just sitting on a sofa watching TV, you know, he's, so he would have a more sophisticated vocabulary, but also of course an internal monologue for any character, even an adult is not the same as what they would say orally. We've always accepted, I think the convention that internal monologue is a kind of a representation of the sophistication of the thoughts rather than the words somebody would speak. So, you know, we don't write these novels as if they are speeches. Um, and with Jack, of course, I thought there would be lots of ways in which he would have vocabulary that was a bit above himself. Um, but also he would still make those basic errors because I read a lot of research about children's linguistic development that said, you know, correcting your child's error, it doesn't actually speed it up. They need to work through the stages. For instance, when they're about five, they often try and make past tenses um, consistent in English. They'll say, I win the race. And you could say, no, no, you won the race. And they will ignore that. that they have to work through that stage and they have to gradually realize English is a mess. And they eventually settle for that and they say, I won the race. But you can't actually speed them through by, by hyper-correcting them. 
Um, so I tried to show that Jack would have this combination of some basic grammatical errors and quite an advanced vocabulary. Um, sometimes he would be able to reproduce a word he's heard adults say, but he doesn't quite know what it means. Then you get a lovely kind of you know, gap there that the reader knows what it means and Jack doesn't. Um, but also I tried to capture the inconsistency of any five-year-old's language because they don't learn language in stages as if they're doing a, um, a Duolingo course. Uh, they learn it in an accretive way. So, you know, every parent has had funny moments of their child coming home with either some really long word you wouldn't expect or some garbled version, some misheard version from a hymn or something. So, um, you know, their language is consistently inconsistent. And that's one thing that makes a five-year-old a great character. Um, but Womb is one of the easiest books I've ever written because once I decided on the kind of rules of the game, as it were, I knew everything that my, my protagonist would know, every experience he's had, every food he's eaten. And then there's a secondary category of things that he's just seen on TV but doesn't know in person. So he thinks he knows cars on TV, but when he's actually driving in a police car, he's appalled the way other cars seem to come at him. You know, he feels perpetually as if he's about to die um, because, you know, cars on a screen are not the same thing. So, so in a way, I, I, I knew the contents of my character's head in a way that makes it much easier to then write a novel from that perspective than if it's some uh, wide-ranging, well-traveled character with a lot of memories. Um, now, Room was very specifically about, you know, being in a locked room and then, and then what freedom is like by contrast. But I noticed I've done a few other novels, like say The Wonder, which is uh, much of it is set in, a, in, in one bedroom in a cabin where a little girl is very ill because she's not eating. She claims she can live without food. And even though nobody's locking her in there, in a way, she's locking herself in there by deciding not to eat. So I'm very interested in you know, lives of constraint, I suppose, probably because I'm interested in women's history and a lot of women have lived lives that are more small and shut in and constrained than, than the men in their families. I mean, I've been in Greek villages, for instance, where it looks as if all the women have died out in a plague, but it's that they're at home, you don't see them and it's the men out in public space, you know, playing games and, and drinking in cafes. So, so I suppose I'm very interested in these, these lives of confinement. And especially when you're writing about childbirth, I mean, confinement is, is one of the words for, for childbirth, you know? And of course, for the baby too, the baby's in, in an ultimately confined space and is trying to emerge out of it. So, so it makes the idea of the, the small room quite a, 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 a suitable concept to focus on both for the mothers and for the babies. I mean, and what you're saying about the confined lives of women, I mean, while you were speaking, I was also thinking of your novel, Frog Music, um, uh, you know, and, and the main characters in, in that book, um, and, and just the confined lives that a lot of your characters, whether they're highborn or lowborn, are forced to, to live. I mean, sometimes not aware of their own confinement in a, in a, in a, cloistered world isn't the right way, but a rarefied world and uh, that, that too. So at, at different ends of the- Yeah, yeah, you're the, right. There are different forms of unfreedom. So, so Blanche, who's a, you know, a burlesque dancer in San Francisco in uh, the frog music, at one point she's literally penniless having been robbed. So she's trying to pick pennies out of the mud so she can buy a cup of beans. And then in the novel like Life Mask, you've um, Anne Damer, the sculptor, who stays home hiding because basically people have have spread rude poems about her, suggesting that she might be a sapphist. So, you know, that stuff that Blanche wouldn't have cared about, but Anne Damer at least has her morning coffee. She has, doesn't have to pick through the mud for it. So, you know, they all have their hands tied in, in different ways. Um, that, uh, I, I want to talk for another minute about Room, just because one of the things that you uh, talked about is the way in which, uh, you know, the, the sense of confinement and then the sense of freedom. And if people haven't read Room, although I hope they have, I mean, I won't uh, say anything about how that exactly uh, uh, transpires in the book. Uh, but can you talk about uh, writing the screenplay of Room? Because here you have a novel in which it is narrated, at least a significant part of it, from the very confined and limited perspective of the five-year-old boy. But then, of course, a movie is not written uh, or uh, it, it's not on the page, it's, it's a different medium. So can you talk about adapting uh, Room? I mean, you were nominated for an Oscar. Congra congratulations on that. So, no, can you believe uh, it? <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose I knew that if I sold rights in Room to a very conventional filmmaker, they would have to gut it. You know, they would probably 
minimize the amount of time spent in the room and they would play up the drama of the capture, the interesting psychopath. And it would be like every TV movie of the week we've ever seen. And I didn't want that. And also many things become more voyeuristic if you show them. And Room had been careful as a novel to not really be about rape. I mean, you know, you deduce that the mother is getting raped every night or two, but it's, it's you know, she screens the child from that. So, you know, he, he literally just hears a creaking bed. That's as bad as it gets. But in a film, everything is more shown and more visible. So I thought I can't have it be a, a tacky, exploited a film which reproduces the exploitation of women rather than commenting on it. So um, I basically said no to any overtures from anyone who seemed too Hollywood or seemed too conventional. And then Lenny Abrahamson, this Irish filmmaker I hadn't heard of, but he's very much from the kind of European art movie tradition. He sent me a 10 page letter spelling out with great sensitivity how he read the novel and how he would like to film it. And you know, I just thought this man completely understands the book. Um, I didn't, wasn't sure would he be able to raise the money to, to um, to make it, that was my only doubt, but I knew he was the genius who should make it, you know? And it, it came together beautifully. I really enjoyed working with him. So basically it was, it was an indie style film in that it was a small Irish film company and we filmed it in Canada. Um, it was not a big budget, um, but it, it got to the Oscars because we just did everything as zealously and beautifully as we could. And um, yeah, it was, a, it was a great experience. So many writers have had bad encounters with the film industry, but I think sometimes it's because we go into it in a naive or passive way, like, oh, look, they've bought my book. And then, oh no, they've turned it into trash. <laughs> Who knew? Um, you know, as any cinema goer should know, many books are turned into trash. So if you, if you want to protect your work, you need to be really discerning about who you sell it to or, or else get very involved yourself. And I, I did both. Um, I did a very strange deal with them where I was, we did an attachment rather than my selling the rights outright. So it meant that I was fully involved and they didn't own the book until the first day of filming. Um, so it was you know, very carefully negotiated to give me as much, not, not control, but as much true involvement as possible for, for a writer. Yeah, so I had a great time. Are you thinking that you would like to adapt uh, any of your other books uh, for you know, movies or, I have, or, or Netflix I, I, long series? I, I have six different film projects. None of them have made it to the screen yet. But yes, I've, I've um, both um, The Wonder and Frog Music. I, I am working with companies um, adapting those for film. Uh, I've adapted a couple of other people's work, um, a, a, a long series. So there are all sorts of film possibilities. They just haven't happened yet, which is so normal for the industry. Whereas, you know, my books, at least I write and they get published. So <laughs> that's very satisfying. That keeps me grounded. I couldn't work full time in film because so many things can interrupt um, a, a film or TV show on its way to production, especially, for instance, COVID. But even before COVID, there are so many right. things um, likely to delay or cancel production. So, you know, thank God I write fiction mostly. <laughs> Um, and, and before we go to audience Q&A, uh, I did want to ask you, I mean, in the pandemic, uh, have you uh, been more productive? I mean, are you working on something uh, new or have I'm you... I'm always working on something new. I would say in the pandemic, I've been a bit distracted. So instead of just sticking to the novel I was working on in March, I jumped ship to another novel for a while and then I jumped ship to a musical. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I think they'll all get written eventually. Okay. I, I've just been a bit, you know watching the news in a way that's unusual for me. But no, it hasn't stopped me writing because writing keeps me sane in, in any weather. You know? And also, so in, to be honest, it's a great comfort to, to concern yourself with stories other than the ongoing horrors of today. You know, it's a great escape. So in, in, are you as addicted in Canada, I mean, to news of your Southern neighbor as often we are of our can't, own? Can't peel my yeah. eyes away. Yeah, okay. yeah. Just nerve wracking. So for, for an hour, we're not thinking about what is going on in our country. Uh, but let me uh, ask you, uh, I think uh, Christine um, Hallett, I, I hope I'm pronouncing people's names correctly. I think we answered her question, which came in um, that while you were researching nursing techniques, did you use uh, primary sources such as nursing textbooks of the time? Uh, is there... I should mention one, yeah. There was a, a handbook of midwifery by an, an, a top Irish doctor. So that was great because it gave me not just the facts of what the nurses and midwives would have been told to do at the time, but it gave me the mentality because it's written in a state of sort of controlled tension. It's like, okay, nurses and midwives, I'm giving you this information and these diagrams just so you'll know when to call the doctor. You know, do not, do not get carried away with all this information and take any decisions yourself. You know, it's, it's a very paradoxical 
practical message. He's like, information, but you, you'll never use this information. Get the doctor, get the doctor. But of course, as they were so understaffed in the hospitals during the flu, it's quite plausible. I thought that my, my nurse would have to actually put more of this information into practice. Um, so yeah, sources like that were crucial, but I always supplemented them with modern sources too to get the actual medicine right, because there's a lot they were wrong about in 1918. I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, the role of the nurse in the hospital, I mean, has completely changed. And, um, you know, your engagement with the healthcare system is often through nurses and you rely on them. Uh, you know. They're a lot more respected um, nowadays. I'm sure they're still not paid enough, but, but they, they are much more empowered in their jobs. Right. Um, could be that some men entered the career. That often does wonders for a career when it's not just women anymore. Um, but, but certainly, yes, you know, a, a nurse back in 1918 had to do a huge amount of kowtowing to her superiors. And there was a, such an emphasis on neatness. You know, entire units of the midwifery course were about neatness and composure and manner and, um, you know, being on time, that kind of thing. I mean, the, the illusion of control over the universe, really. I mean, if you didn't know what was going on on a microcosmic level or, you know, the microbes, uh, you know, always, you could at least control the appearance of the, the universe as if it were clean and that was going to help you, et cetera, uh, orderly. Um, but uh, in, in terms of, you know, one thing that we've sort of danced around. I mean, when we've talked about some of the plots of your novels, I wanted to ask this question without giving uh, anything away, but Carolyn Fick, I, I hope I've pronounced um, her, her name correctly. Um, did you always know that uh, two, two of your uh, characters, two of the three characters in this book uh, would fall in love and uh, uh, that that they would love each other. I mean, again, we won't say who they are. Yes, you know, that's... funnily enough, I can't remember the moment when I decided that, which probably means it was very early because I often remember points where I change my mind about a character or, or where new research makes me make the plot bend somewhere. But yeah, I think very early on, I decided that I was writing a kind of a women's equivalent of a, a, a World War I trenches novel for men, you know, that I was creating this intense little space where women would all be laboring in different ways, either to push babies out of themselves or to get babies out of other women. And that this would create such an intense atmosphere that it almost seemed as if a falling in love would, would naturally happen as a result of these intense circumstances. Um, and, and yeah, I, yeah, I honestly can't remember when that came to me. You know, I, I don't put I don't put um, you know same sex storylines in all my books, but they come up at least in one and three maybe, and maybe particularly in situations that are so fraught that it seems as if the rules might well bend. You know, people who wouldn't let themselves behave in an unorthodox way in their usual lives. You know, they might be pushed by by circumstances to to just sort of live in the moment and accept what's happening to them without knowing that it was coming. Um, so yeah, very very early on, I decided that. And it was partly in order to, to, to put a kind of a core of happiness in the book, because of course I know there's a lot of horrors and bad things happen, but in a way, because there's so much external conflict in the book, you know, there are police raiding the hospital looking for the doctor and death is stalking basically, um, the flu and the, and the childbirth dangers. So I had to have some real sweetness between the people. And I thought I could have um, many of my characters, you know, treat each other very well, really. There's a lot of sort of mutual support among those patients in the ward because you've got all that conflict coming from the outside so yeah I suppose I thought love would be a, a helpful um, element of the tonal balance you know and people surprise at their own emotions I mean you know that's an important driver I think of narrative uh, you know the narrative in any fiction you know not only that people know what they're thinking and feeling but that they are surprised by their own feelings. Um, Absolutely, and, that... and one thing I played with was the idea of catching love as this kind of contagion, you know, just as you don't know that fatal moment when, when you inhale the, the, you know, COVID particles, similarly, you don't know when you start falling in love with someone. I think that's why people who've just fallen in love and, and acknowledge it to each other, they often immediately say, when did it first happen? When did you know? Because, you know, the, the process could be very like um, catching some contagion. So I, I wanted to see could the whole thing happen in just a few days, um, just like flu. Well, that's that's a different kind of pull of the stars. Uh, um, but that's wonderful. I mean, I'm just so happy right now to be smiling <laughs> amid you know the moment of of, of the. 
pandemic. Um, so there is a question. Oh, I just wanted to say, yep, uh, in New York, I live opposite a church. So that were those were the church bells oh, chiming. Oh, bells they were. I knew somebody noon. in my time zone. Yes. Um, and it was also a useful signal that we are nearing the end of our conversation. Uh, you know, the, do not ask for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for <laughs> for, for we. Um, so uh, there is a question um, from. John uh, Rosenfield, which I think you sort of answered right now. So uh, how did you balance the reality of death and new life in your book? I mean, I think that's that's related yeah, to the love I mean, question. We talked but... about horror versus, say, love, but there's also at the very practical level who lives, who dies. Um, I mean, there's a reason this novel is not a month long. I didn't want to put you all through <laughs> multiple deaths. So I wanted to make it long enough that you'd have a few births and a few deaths um, and it would it would feel really intense, but wouldn't go on forever. So I did a lot of almost, you know, horse trading with myself, like kind of, oh, okay, if, if that bad thing happens to that mother, maybe at least she can survive. And if, if, if a baby's stillborn, then at least the next one could be okay, you know? And I, I felt terrible about it in many cases, but I couldn't just let everyone survive because then it would not be a true depiction of a pandemic at all. Um, so, so yeah, I kind of sweated over those decisions of who lives and who dies. Um, I didn't want them to be obvious, and I also didn't want them to be too evenly doled out. You know, I think there's a couple of deaths on the first day and the third, but then on the second day, nobody dies. So I, I wanted it to have that unpredictable feel. And childbirth is such a gift to novelists because it's so wonderfully unpredictable. I mean, to start with, it's not an illness. It's a phenomenon that can kill you or can be the happiest day of your life. Um, and, and one thing that inspired that was when I was giving birth to our, our first child um, 16 years ago, uh, you know, the birth went like a breeze, except your one little thing went wrong afterwards, basically the placenta wouldn't come out. I don't know if any of you wanted to hear it, but too late now. But anyway, um, a, a gynecologist rushed in and more or less saved me but with rapid action over a couple of minutes. And afterwards, when I, when I realized, you know, why she'd worked so fast, I thought, that's the moment where the fact that I live in a country with good health care has saved my life. That's exactly the moment where if I was in a part of the world where I wasn't getting health care or couldn't afford good health care, that's where I would have died. It was just it was an eerie kind of branching of the path moment. I felt my privilege like I never had before. I was like, all the years I get after this are because I live in a country with good health care. You know, it was just an unnerving moment. And I suppose. And so I put that directly into the book. Um, I was very interested in, you know, all the things that I kill or save these women and all the things that affect them long before the flu ever came along so, you know pandemics are not random at all pandemics hit those who we have decided to allow to be weakened by by you know things like poverty beforehand um so so I really wanted at a very visceral level for that to be a factor in in the um you know the who lives and who dies of this novel I mean, that's a wonderful uh, way in which also you're giving us a sense of how even in a historical novel, I mean, this is set in the early 20th century, but you know, you've know, you written novels set in the 18th century, the 19th century, also that uh, even in historical novels, you're drawing on your own personal experience, uh, which might seem to be, quote, anachronistic, but actually reflect something uh, about the time. I suppose I thought, you know, uh the ways in which childbirth can go wrong, that's a fairly trans-historical thing. You could probably, you know, get that happening anywhere. I mean, how, you know, how uh, medical staff respond to it is different. Um, but, but yeah, the basic facts of what can happen uh, can happen anytime. No, I think I quite often put autobiographical material into historical fiction. Yeah, it's often assumed that a novel set now will be very much about your life. A novel set then will be some kind of history lesson, but no, we, we use what we have, you know? <laughs> Um, so there, there are a couple of questions that are, uh, I'll, I'll draw hopefully into to one. Um, Anna Blessing asks, what writers have influenced you? And um, Deborah Le, Lebruna, I think I, again, I think I pronounced that correctly. Where do you get your ideas for your books? And what I want to draw in is something uh, that you mentioned earlier uh, in, uh, Sorry to keep coming back to, to Life Mask, but you know, Life Mask came to you. It seemed when you uh, came upon uh, a, you know a, a, do, a, a someone's. Uh, I'm going to look um, uh, at exactly what you said. Um, that you uh, 
were drawn Mrs. Thrail Piazzi's to diary. Mrs. Thrail's yeah. book. Yeah, I mean, got and, a little and rude rhyme the idea about came from you. Sculpture. So if, if you could talk about, you know, as, as uh, Anna asked, what writers have influenced you, how your ideas come from you. And the question I wanted to sort of inject there is you wrote a PhD on the uh, 18th century uh, novel. And I wondered if that made it harder or easier to actually write a novel set in the 18th century. So I if think you it can answer easier. all of our questions. No, I, th I think my experience of going off to Cambridge to do a PhD and having years on end in a really good library, I think it really set me free. It was like uh, an amazing travel path that lets you travel the world. I think it means I feel comfortable about writing about previous eras, not just the 18th century, in a way many novelists don't. And some novelists just feel ethically, you have to represent your time and place. And I think, why limit yourself, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I think it really opened up the world of history to me and in particular to historical facts, which, which aren't part of the received narrative. And so I'm very interested in kind of revisionist histories as it were, writing about the, the, nobody, the nobodies and the oddities. Um, so, I mean, the question of where do you get your ideas, that's usually answered often in a sort of semi-mystical way. But actually, often the, the answer is the same as for what writers have influenced you. We get our ideas from often from other writers. I don't mean we steal them after a, a coffee at a conference, but we read each other's <laughs> books. Um, for instance, um, okay, two writers who lie behind the pull of the stars um, and, and the title in particular. Uh, when I was a teenager, I would have seen several plays by Sean O'Casey from the 1920s. And they are often about the Dublin slums and the rather heroic attempts of families and mothers in particular to, to carry on their lives in these squalid conditions. And one of those is called The Plow and the Stars, um, named for the kind of worker's flag. So I know that, that that is echoed in The Pull of the Stars. And again, Roddy Doyle, a, a contemporary novelist I absolutely love, um, and, and I think I, I buy all of his in hardback. <laughs> so Roddy Doyle wrote a brilliant novel, a trilogy, and the first one is called A Star Called Henry. And that is about the working class and how they might have joined in, in the revolution in, in the 1910s in Ireland, um, not from a sort of abstract nationalism, but from a, a wish to make their lives better. And that was the first book I read that made me realize that nationalism, which I'd been very you know, distanced from growing up, and um, that that might have actually have had a kind of a, you know, a social justice side, that it was about, you know, freedom for the poor from their from their miserable lives rather than just the more abstract issue of who rules Ireland. So yeah, I would say, you know, Roddy Doyle and, and Sean O'Casey have influenced me there. Um, there's even a novel I can't find. I'm sure I read a novel set in a Russian hospital where lots of women were having abortions and they they bonded and chatted to each other. And I've tried to track down this novel, but but can't find it. Um, so so even books you don't remember the title or the author of can rub off on you. Um, and there are other books that I absolutely love, but I don't think they've shaped me. I've read everything by Lee Child, for instance, but yet I've never created a sort of Jack Reacher style lean thriller, you know? <laughs> so especially books from outside your usual genre. I think sometimes they don't affect you, but you, you can hugely enjoy them as a reader. Well, I love that you we, we you know, sort of began with the locked room mystery, almost like, you know, Agatha Christie or you know something like that. And now we're talking about Lee Child and yet you're books don't seem to have uh, very much in common with those. You know, one book that you, while I was reading The Pull of the Stars, I thought of another book. Uh, uh, so much of what we read is accident and then you know, what we think of as we're reading another book. But uh, earlier uh, in the pandemic, I read uh, A Long, Long Way by Sebastian Barry, which is set in uh, Ireland and then also World War One, And it felt to me that these at least in my own emotional experience reading them, they were joined uh, you know, as companions in my mind, but, but again, only accidentally because I happened to have just read uh, A Long, Long Way and then uh, not long after read Pull of the Stars. So uh, I guess we have um, answered all of the questions that we have here. Uh, my questions- We've sorted uh, out the universe, have we? The, right. Yes, I mean, we have settled <laughs> everything, uh, which uh, I appreciate your helping uh, me to do uh, personally for this hour. And I think everyone in Charleston or wherever you are joining us from has been very pleased to hear uh, you talk about your work. Uh, I know I learned a lot and um, I hope people will read Pull of the Stars. I'm very glad that one of the people in the audience at least has already uh, read it. Um, and so I guess it just leaves us to say thank you to Charleston to Charleston for thank you, Charleston, having us to here. Charleston. It was lovely.
and uh, promise that we will meet again there. You'll come to Charleston next year if we are allowed and we will uh, do this again or I will sit in the audience and watch you have a conversation with a different interviewer. So anyway, thank you, Emma. Uh, and so. thank you uh, to our hosts uh, at Charleston Today.